Uh, who maintains an open source project that you didn't start in this audience? Well, there's a lot of hands. I guess my, my job is done. I don't need to, to be here. Uh, so I, I have to, uh, to mention I did not draw my own slides. I apologize. I work for an art company. I should be able to freehand it easily. Uh, but I spend more time writing software than drawing. However, we do, we do draw on a regular basis. Um, I also have uh, other disclaimers uh, in this talk. I tend to exaggerate things, and then I'll give examples of people that don't really exist or exist in other worlds. Um, it's really just to make it a little bit funnier. So um, a few years ago, about 10 years ago, I was looking for uh, some silly piece of technology to do some installation sequencing. And I found an awesome bootstrapper project that just chained installers together. And uh, it was run by, it was an open source project. It wasn't on GitHub yet, but there was a rather competent developer that seemed to be uh, working on it. And he was Italian. I figured it out just by looking at a little bit of his history. And uh, he, uh, he did a great job. He wrote the whole thing. He was maintaining it. Uh, I sent some bug fixes, some really simple stuff. And uh, he was very helpful. He was there. It was great. And my company adopted it for all its software uh, across the board. It was a big deal. We had a team of about 50 engineers. And we started using it very, very heavily. And then uh, one day, he was gone. And um, this was in the middle of a release. And I kind of panicked a little bit. Because I, I, had a, I now had a problem on my hand. I had a few fixes for the code. And I needed some help from him uh, to figure out whether these fixes even make sense and what the side effects are going to be of uh, those fixes. I really had no idea. And uh, he just disappeared. And uh, so you know, I, I thought, I'll copy the code. I'll make some local patches. We'll ship a release. And in the meantime, I have you know, 50 engineers. They have all kinds of issues. They need help with each individual installer. They have also personal problems. And there's just all kinds of things to do. And um, you know, I'm looking at this and saying, why? Why did this just happen? Well, what is this guy? He, you know, he uh, isn't he supposed to leave the project in good hands once he doesn't want to work on it? Uh, and I, I started googling him. I started trying to find him. I tried to find a phone number, an email. No reply. Nothing. And um, you know, this is a famous quote. I was I was really upset. Like he he abandoned me <laughs> in my in my needs and just. Vanished. Uh, well, you know, sometimes stuff happens in life, <laughs> and um, you might not act. You might not be in control of your own uh, of your own things. Turns out that uh, he had he had some other issues outside of software, and uh, you know, disappeared in a, in a newspaper. Um, so I understand. You know, things things happen in life, and you might not be able to maintain your open source projects. <laughs> and uh, in the meantime. You got this, this crowd who's using it, and uh, the GitHub issues just pile up. What's going on? Should we take over? There hasn't been a, a fix in a long time. Um, and it's particularly striking when you, 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 you use something, you realize something is broken. You make a code fix to the thing that's broken. You make a pull request, and then you look at the list of pull requests, and it's like, fix the same thing, fix the same thing, fix the same thing. And each one of them gets closed. Oh, I realize somebody else has already fixed it. It just hasn't been merged in a long time. So that was, that was me in that situation. I really need this thing. You know? And in fact, it's not just me. It's uh, my entire company really needs this. I mean, we've got shipping software riding on this. We've got millions of dollars, uh, many millions of dollars. I was working on some security software for the government. Um, it's your taxpayer money at work. And um, we, we really need this thing. And now it's, it's, it, doesn't have, it doesn't have its heart. The person who wrote it, the very important uh, person. And you know what I don't have? I don't have time. Um, I really don't have time to deal with this. The whole, the whole point of using somebody else's project was to, uh, to not do the work. I mean, somebody else wrote it. I'm happy to com contribute some bug fixes, but I don't want to deal with this thing. Uh, it's hairy, it's big, it's C++, it's complicated. Uh, I don't want to do it. I don't have time to do this. I, I'm a manager. I have a job with, uh, where I have to counsel people, and I have to tell them what to do and all those important things. So um, you know, at the same time, while there are many contributors and many, uh, 
many people who are using it, just like me, and being very upset at the guy who, you know, unfortunately can't maintain the project anymore, uh, really none of us in this group of people want to take charge. Nobody really wants this thing. And it's big enough and complicated enough that nobody actually wants to, to step, up, step up at all. So we're all looking at each other, and we're commenting on the same pull request, talking to GitHub. And you know, GitHub has a lot of repos, and so they don't really care. Uh, and they're not really trying to, to help you at all. They're like, okay, keep commenting. Um, so somebody, somebody needs to step up, and somebody needs to take over this project. And that somebody I decided was going to be me. And I felt really small in this uh, compared to the size of the problem and how many people were using it. Um, however, I thought it was necessary. And I'm not sure what pushed me to do that, but uh, I, I want to tell some of the stories of how, how that happens. Um, so the first thing that, that I try, and I, I did this a few times after, after that episode, the first thing that anybody would try is to contact the, um, to contact the maintainer of the project. And uh, you know the true story is that the guy, the, this, this was some mafia boss. Uh, I, I thought that was a more striking example. However, the true story of the guy who abandoned his project was that he opened a vineyard and disconnected from the internet. And um, you know, I, I sent him emails and I said, "Listen, I, I've been using this project, and uh, I also I run a team. Uh, I've contributed some fixes. I put some credentials up front, uh, saying, you know, this is." This is me, and I'm a responsible person. I really want to help. Uh, I also have been involved in some other uh, things before. And so I, I showed. I wrote a list. I said, here are things that I worked on. And uh, it's not just some random guy on the internet, uh, some random developer somewhere on the other side of the Atlantic trying to take over your, your precious project. It's, uh, we're going to actually make it happen. Uh, and I also put my team behind this. I said. I have a number of engineers, and here are some of them, some of their profiles and some of their names. And we're actually going to maintain this. And we're going to create a group around this, and we're going to do it. So I put a lot of, a lot of credentials forward. I wanted to, the person on the other side to feel really good about uh, moving, about giving away the project to a competent set of people. And so, however, uh, people are actually human. And uh, there is a ton of reasons why somebody would not want to even reply to you. And uh, just recently, I've tried to take over somebody's open source project that's quite good. Um, I tweeted, I emailed, and uh, I, I didn't call. I didn't stalk. I didn't go to the address of the person. However, I can see they are there. They are alive. They're tweeting cat pictures every couple of hours. And they've got you know, a life and a Facebook profile and kids and whatnot. And they just do not reply. And I think it's really weird. However, uh, we have to understand that, that humans uh, sometimes just don't feel confident enough to do it. They're afraid that this, maybe the, this is a little baby of theirs, this, the project, the thing that they worked on, may not even be good enough for public consumption. And it's only an accident that somebody uses it. Or may, they, they may have moved on, and they might not care anymore. And they're, just, they're not ready to re-engage. And that's just the reality of things. So really, if that happens, if the person on the other side is really not willing to give away the project uh, to a group of people, then all you have left is to fork it. And that, that's totally OK. However, before we do that, we're going to try and get to, uh, to a better place. And so ideally, what you want, and especially for Ruby projects, is that the owner gives it away to you. And that is just two things. GitHub, read write, ac read, write access, and the ability to add maintainers. You have to ask to become an owner of the project, not just a committer. And then RubyGems access. I don't know how many times I've taken over a project where I realized three weeks later, trying to make a release, oh, I forgot to ask for RubyGems access. Now I can't push the gem. That's a real bummer. And I already asked for a favor. I already got pretty far, and now I have to go and ask again. So I, now I just ask for these two very specific things. Um, and you know, eventually, hopefully, the maintainer is like, OK, please help. Please contribute. Here's all the access. That's great. Um, if, you, if they're responsive, the one thing that might be really useful is to uh, ask them to donate the project to a larger community. 
Uh, this happened to a very famous, a very large Java, um, Java project, and uh, the owner, who worked for a very big company, as the last grand gesture, uh, agreed to rename the namespace from you know, the megacorp.com to the project name.io, something like that, and it's like a big deal in the Java world. And um, they, he also wrote an email to the group of people saying, you know, I'm going to step down. And uh, here's a group of people that is going to replace me that, that at least claims that they want to do this. So that, that transition is really important. If you can get the owner on the other side to do it for you, that's great. Um, now that you own the project, you can rule it. <laughs> and uh, you've got the power. You're in full control. You can make all kinds of decisions that are, uh, they don't even have to be controversial. You know, like 90% of the people who are using this project are going to agree with you. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you can profit from this. You can put it on your resume. You can be like, I'm the maintainer of this awesome, popular project. You know, maybe there'll be money at the end of this. Well, um, actually, not at all. Now you have to do. Now you have to do the real work. So you've inherited this thing. It's usually in a pretty bad state. There's tons of pull requests. There's people. There's a lot of frustration. Now you're going to have to do work. And so this, this is something that can become clockwork if you do this often. The first thing is you just need to organize the project. You just need to set up whatever basics in, a, in any project that you would like to participate in are. So anybody knows what this is? So uh, you know, don't, we don't use those anymore. We use email. For larger projects, uh, you want a mailing list. For smaller ones, I actually like the GitHub issues. Uh, you, like, you constantly have people saying, oh, where do I get help? And you, know, you can just tell them, get help, ask a, ask a question on the mailing list, or use a GitHub issue or something like that. Uh, you need a license for these things, because uh, you're going to be asked a thousand times, uh, why is, what's the license for this project? Sometimes those things are missing from day one. I use the MIT license because it's short. I don't really read it. Um, <laughs> you want to get uh, build automation running for, uh, for it. So Travis is wonderful. Uh, you just hook it up. You get the builds running, some changes to a rake file, and off you go. You now have builds. Uh, you'll notice a pattern. You're trying to work yourself out of any mechanical job. You actually don't want to be maintaining the project, per se. You want to create automation so that other people can contribute and grow. So there's actually a bunch of other things you can use today. There is code climate. There is dependency counts. There's all kinds of badges. I don't like to be badge heavy, but uh, no, just, it's fine. If you, if you have a set of things that you really love, just throw them in there. It will, it will look good. It will be all green. Um, the one thing that I encourage you to do right away is to list in the readme um, things of how to get to uh, to get help. So things like, you know, if it's a downloadable binary, where to download it uh, doesn't apply to Ruby too much. Uh, where to get help, what to do, like things that are workflow, basic workflow, essentials, whatever it is, and then the getting started and the how to use this and go and update these readmes and make them make them cleaner, make it make it look like the project is alive. Um, one of my favorite things to do is to add a change log. I'm very frustrated by Ruby projects that don't have a change log. Uh, you have no idea what has happened before. So the way I run change logs is uh, it's, it's very simple, markdown file. And it will, I will start by saying, next release, your contribution here. That creates an environment where people are welcome to contribute to the project. And then I ask, uh, I'm very specific about the format I like, and this is completely personal. However, what I want is to be able to look up history online. So I want a link to the, uh, to the GitHub pull request if, uh, for a fix or a feature, something like that. The explanation, this one comes from Hashi, uh, which I took over a while ago. And then uh, I always put people's names with a link at the end, which gives them a real sense of ownership. And I don't know how many pull requests I've said, please add the line to the change log. Uh, this happens all the time. People contribute things, and they don't call their, their work out. So uh, I always do this. I really like having clean change logs. The other thing is a contributing document. Uh, the way I develop contributing documents is I take them from the last project I, I wrote the contributing document to. It's kind of like your dev setup. You use the last person uh, from who did the dev setup to do the next dev setup. So um, I take 
the, these contributing things are very, very specific, and they're really targeted to somebody who has never contributed to a project. And I've noticed that when you have a very clear contributing explanation, which is fork the repo, uh, make the change, push the change, update the change log, make a pull request, and then at the end, I always say that you, know, you should be patient. This is, it's likely that your change will not be merged, and that somebody very nitpicky is going to argue about uh, periods at the end of change log lines or something like that. But really, you know, we, we, we as a community value your time and work, and we really love you. And that, that has resonated with a lot of people. I've got emails about how nice it is to read this, and I got a ton of readme updates. People who read the contributing guidelines and they notice a tiny little problem, they'll actually take the time to fix it and they'll actually do it, especially junior developers. Um, and finally, uh, I, you want a releasing document. That's actually surprisingly uh, rare in Ruby projects. Uh, sometimes releasing is as simple as typing, you know, rake release or something like that and maybe updating a version. But uh, this is what you want to give to new maintainers of projects. You want to tell them, uh, I'll talk about this a little bit later, here, I want you to do a release. Please follow the guidelines in the releasing document. It might be obvious, but if you've never released the Ruby gem, you know, it's, not, it's not that obvious. Uh, finally, you want an upgrading document. This is something uh, that is essential for projects that have some kind of API. You want people to use them. You want to give some history uh, about how to upgrade. Uh, I love the colors of the new GitHub labels. So I'm, I always go in and I delete the uh, current GitHub labels, which are boring and, uh, and bland, and I create these. Um, I'm thinking about the workflow of how somebody uh, puts, has a question maybe, or maybe reports a bug. Usually when they do that, they're not sure, they're not 100% sure that this is actually the case. So I, have, I start with creating a label called bug question mark. And whenever somebody puts in a, a bug in, uh, in issues, I'll, I'll go and assign a bug question mark to it. Uh, and so this is a good way for me to acknowledge that I've actually seen that, uh, that issue. I'll just quickly skim over it and then just put the label. Uh, there's chores, there's confirmed bug. Confirmed bugs are great. When you reference uh, an existing bug that you know is a bug, that somebody actually took the time to confirm that this is a problem, then you can give a link, and then they can go and see, oh yeah, this is, this is a real problem, I understand. Now I can actually fix it. Maybe I can write a test for it. Um, you always want to leave room for discussion. Uh, the maintainer's role is not necessarily to do long-term roadmaps or stuff like that, but you want to welcome some kind of feedback, and it's a great place to redirect sometimes trolls. You just write uh, an issue, put a label of discuss on it, and people can argue about it. New feature request questions, and then you can help has been actually quite good. I've definitely seen pull requests for small things, uh, either small things that you just somebody could code, or really big things that are really complicated. And uh, a couple of issues on these, on these complicated libraries have been, been taken over by, by really competent people where you know, the, the thread, the discussion is like, I give up, this is too complicated. Uh, I don't know how to fix this. And then people would really try when they see this you can help thing. And by the way, the colors don't matter. You can use your own. Um, finally, uh, it's when you, when, you see this, uh, when you see this merged uh, pull request uh, uh, label, you know that the project is active. So now you've got a backlog. I think on Hashi, we had like four pages of GitHub pull requests up there, uh, a year worth of work by uh, probably 50 people. So you have to go through each one of them since you're taking over the project, figure out what to do with it, merge it. And it's a, it's a merge nightmare because you have... Uh, you know, you have 10 things that are colliding. And then decide what goes in, what doesn't go in, what, doesn't go, what gets thrown out, and discuss it with the people who are there. Um, I love Rubocop. I always put it in right away. This cuts all... The, who, who doesn't know what Rubocop is? Oh, wow, so many hands. Rubocop is an amazing uh, project. It is a Ruby syntax linter. Uh, it basically takes, for example, you know, 193 syntax doesn't require... Uh, curly braces anymore for hashes. Rubocop can automatically uh, clean up your code and can create a violation next, next time somebody puts it in. So you never have to argue about the layout of code ever again. And it's a two-liner to add to your rake file, you know, jam Rubocop and you're done. Rubocop also has something that's awesome. It's uh, autogen uh, config. 
So you run RuboCop the first time, and it finds all kinds of violations. And you run it with this autogen config, it creates a RuboCop YML configuration file that just says, you have all these issues, and I'm going to ignore them. And here's the number of violations in them. So it takes five minutes. You create this config. You make no code changes other than the automatic cleanup that's done by RuboCop. And uh, next time somebody makes a pull request, they have to abide to the layout of the code. And it's somebody that just decided these are the best uh, Ruby uh, syntax practices. You, know, you, have, you don't write curly braces with four spaces after them or stuff like that. No more discussions about whether I like my left alignment, tab, spaces, all that stuff is handled by software. So this is wonderful. I always add it. You have, in pull requests, uh, dozens of people have made pull requests, and it didn't get merged, and they're hopeless. They abandoned ship. They're gone, they don't care anymore, they might have moved on, or they're still suffering. Uh, kind of like me in the beginning of that, uh, of that project. You want to send them personal email and comment on their pull requests and say, you know, from now on, hope is there. Giving people hope is something extremely powerful, and they love it. And they're going to be with you, and they will take a lot of problems, and they will really wait and be patient and work with it. So recruiting the hopeless, in a, creating this new team and kind of recreating the community around it is really important. Um, finally, you want to make a release. And this is where the job of a maintainer has its first validation. And this is where you get the kind of the first satisfaction of have accomplished something. Now it's really yours. You've made the release of this Ruby gem that you took over. Uh, it's there. And you can claim it. Now, remember my slides of uh, fame, profit, and, uh, and rule? That's, that's where you put, you put those. This is where you start making the money. So um, uh, as, uh, it's, it's not that of a, uh, of, of a great job. Uh, you have to pick up a lot of trash uh, and, uh, after, after people. There is, uh, you have to make sure that you comment on every single pull request, that you answer every single question on the mailing list. You have to be the last person to do it. I never do it right away. I let other people try to step in, and kind of try to step back from now on and create space for other maintainers to be able to, uh, to, to step in. Uh, but however, things get unanswered, and you really want to answer those. Even if it's I don't know, let's think about it. Anybody has ideas you want it to make look alive. Um, you have to create workflow, and this workflow is personal to your project. You know, I encourage people, when they report a bug, I ask them to write a test that reproduces the bug. And then once they wrote the test, I tell them, well, now you can fix it. So that's kind of a, a good workflow. <laughs> uh, and um, you know, we update change log, and so on and so forth. So these things become automatic. Uh, and I usually will spend you know, half a day every, every week going through uh, all the open source projects that I maintain and just finish, pick up the trash, the, the stuff that was dropped down, um, and, then and then try to to encourage people to, uh, to do this stuff. You want a reputation of caring. This is, this is awesome. Uh, don't you love coming to a project where the maintainers really care about what you have to say about your problem, about your bug, when they want to discuss it, they want to help you. And if you're trying to make a contribution, you really feel welcome. Um, and this is something you just do every day, and eventually it sinks in. The hardest thing to do in any open source project is create new owners. Um, I have a very simple rule of thumb of finding new owners. First of all, I try to have them on day one. From day one, in those pull requests that have been abandoned, I'm going to look for several things. Number one, I'm going to look for amazing Ruby programmers, people who can do something really simple, really clean, who really get it in their first pull requests. And they often are, some of them are junior, some of them are senior. Uh, it's really not a criteria of how long you've been doing it, but there's just some amazing programmers out there. I'm going to always try to identify them, and I'm going to make them owners. I'm going to bring them into this, into this project by, by giving them read-write access as a, as a matter of trust. I'm going to say, you now are part of the team, or at least ask them, would you like to be part of the team first, and, um, and have them have a sense of, some sense of ownership. I also am going to try to work myself out of that job. One other thing that you can do if you work in teams, and especially if you are in some, uh, in some management role, you actually have people on your team who are dying to have open source uh, work. They want that. They, they saw it with other people, and they think it's awesome, but they just don't know where to start. Those people, you can actually assign them to be owners. And uh, somebody I talked to gave me a story of where she took over an open source project, and the first thing she did 
was to assign somebody on her team to basically do all the work that I've just described. And that person felt extremely fulfilled and was very thankful. It was a great entrance into open source world. Um, everybody knows the myth of the, the, the story of the chicken and the pig. They want to open a restaurant and the, uh, the, they're going to call it ham and eggs. And the pig thinks about it. It's like, no, I don't want to open a restaurant called ham and eggs. You'll be involved and I'll be committed. Uh, there is a ton of people who, are, uh, who, are very, who want to be involved, but are uh, not committed. They have lots of opinions, and sometimes they're called trolls. Sometimes they have something valuable to say. Sometimes they want to talk about grand plans for the future. None of that matters. The only thing that matters is just making progress every day. It's digging. It's moving forward. So none of these, none of these projects have any discussions around the futures or some hypothetical next step. The way you want to contribute thought uh, into the project is by writing code. And by making pull requests, they might not be complete, they might be experimental, but this is how you start. You always have to attach code to your ideas, and you have to make progress every day. So uh, I wanted to, the, the, the contents are not important, but I wanted to show two projects that I uh, maintained and took over, and some of you may know them. How many here use Grape? Oh, there's a, at least two dozen hands. That's awesome. So uh, I've been maintaining uh, Grape for a number of years now. And I didn't start the project. I started using it at Artsy. And uh, this is one release. Look at this list. There is about 12 to 15 contributors in that list. This is a super active project. It has, right now, 4,800 stars on GitHub. And it's used all over the place. This is a project that could have been dead, but a lot of people need it. And this is extremely gratifying. My name is not in that list. I have not written a line of code in that release. This is entirely done by the community of people. There is now something like five or six maintainers in it. Another very impo important project is Hashi. Uh, it's used by everyone. And I, I feel like today, the same thing is happening to Rack Contrib, for example. Well, the Rack Contrib does not have an owner. And I probably won't be the one to step up. Maybe one, some of you will. But um, this is the issue tracker. In, uh, in Hashi, and you can see this is actually very active. And Hashi was, had not seen a commit for a whole year, and it's used all over the place. Um, and so that's another very important project and very rewarding to see this thing. So I want to leave you with, with one thought. Um, we have more code that we can handle on GitHub. There's so much source code out there. And source code is a huge liability, and this is not at all what we need. What we need is we need a community of people who contribute to these open source projects, who do the management work, the maintenance work, the dirty work, the hard work, the work that engages other people, the work that creates groups, the work that rises people to the occasion and helps them contribute in a meaningful way. That's really what we need. What we need is a community of people around these open source projects. It's not the most awesome code. So I encourage you to be part of creating a community around your small or big open source projects. And, and, and really embrace that, that thought. Thank you.